Okay, shall we, um, shall we start? Uh, can I first of all welcome everyone here? It looks like a pretty cool turnout tonight. Um, I'm Francis Hicks from Melbourne at 21. And uh, we hold regular meetings here, monthly meetings here, uh, with a number of partners. We work with the Great, Great London Debate Group, and Tony's here hiding somewhere, he's just come in. Uh, we are working today with the London Pew Press. We work with lots of groups. And we've been dealing with two main topics in our Conway Hall meetings. We hold meetings elsewhere like the House of Commons is on. But our Conway Hall meetings, we've been concentrating on future education and future democracy. And this meeting is on future democracy. Now, we have done quite a lot of meetings already on democracy. We've looked at deliberative democracy. We've looked at sortition, random selection. Uh, we've looked at direct democracy. The last meeting we looked at how corporate power can take over democracy. But the one thing we haven't really looked at is how the digital revolution, artificial intelligence, and the era of big data will impact on democracy. Now we've got three speakers to help us to, today to go through that. Um, most of you will know David, David Wood, who is the founder of the London Futurist. And I know there are a lot of you here tonight from the London Futurist, so you will know him. We've got Indra Adnan here, who is um, who's a writer, a consultant, network builder, events organizer, and she's interested in the area of soft power, conflict transformation, and integral leadership. And we've got Lena, Lena Denchik, who is senior lecturer at Cardiff University in the School of Journalism. And when we did our meeting on corporate power and whether that impacts on democracy. Person Goldsmith, who spoke there in Des Friedman, said if you're going to do anything on AI and democracy, get me there. So I told her after she said yes straight away. And she brought her mum with that, which is great. Um, so uh, you know those are the three speakers. I mean the, the age of big data and AI is going to have a real impact on democracy. And often we don't think in what way it is. Some people think it's going to enhance it. It's going to make information better for both citizens and decision makers. Other people think it's going to be controlled by big corporations like Google and Facebook, and therefore democracy is going to be really seriously challenged. And other people, like Alex Pedlin in the University of North America, who's written a book called Social Physics, argues that big data might even take over from democracy if we're not careful, because big data and sentiment analysis can find out more about you and me and the neighbourhoods we live in than democracy can and families can. They can know more about you than your husband, wife or partner can. Well, that may not be difficult. But they, they can learn a huge amount about you. And therefore, democracy in a sort of way becomes redundant. And that's the big worry. And it raises a lot of ethical questions. So we're going to look at that tonight. We're going to ask whether sortition, direct democracy, deliberative democracy, all the things we talk about are really not worth talking about because we're going to lose them anyhow in the age of artificial intelligence and big data. Or is there a way we can regain them for ourselves? Anyhow, we're going to start with Indra and then Nina and then David. They're going to speak exactly for 10 minutes each. And then, and I'll give you when you've got one minute to go, and then we're going to open it up to you to join in. Um, I don't know if there are any seats available. There are a few chairs outside, by the way, if you want to bring them in. Anyhow, thank you, Indra, and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to use my stopwatch here just to, to help me. Um, good evening, everybody. Great to see you. I'm hoping that you're all here because you're really interested in democracy and how to save it. Um, the thing that uh, France didn't actually know about me, um, that I have all these different hats on, and I'm a psychotherapist and a soft power consultant, but in fact, what I've been doing for the last year and a half is I'm running a new political platform. So instead of talking about it, we've started, my colleagues and I, have started to build a different kind of politics. And it's a political <coughs> platform because in this country, as you already know, there's not much point in starting a new political party because you just get lost in Westminster and you get sucked into the political culture and that's the end of you, really. So a new political party, uh, sorry, a new political platform means that we're gathering every bit of information we can to ask the question, if politics is broken, what's the alternative? And we do three things. We run a daily alternative. 
we do networking events like this, joining up the dots between all the good people who are trying to save our democracy, and then we run political laboratories uh, in and around the country. So that's just really brief. That's what the alternatives are there. So um, my question to you, and I'm going to be very fast, but 10 minutes, not really used one, um, is really to put the human case. If it's man against the machine, what is the man or the woman? What is the human being? that is trying to save its own democracy, and that's kind of where I'm going to start. So the question is, have we ever had a democracy? That's a really good thought, isn't it? Because when democracy was first, democracy was first invented, you know, it was invented without the idea that women would take part or that slaves would take part. Um, it was always something that belonged to elites. And we've never really had, as individual human beings, we've never really had that feeling of agency or control over what happens around us or in our country. So maybe we should turn the thing upside down and start thinking about how can we begin a democracy in the age of artificial intelligence? How can we start that? So only 2%, if you can imagine this, only 2% of people in the UK and across Europe are members of political parties. So already, you know, we're in a situation where people are not that interested in their democracy, they're not interested in political parties, they don't know what politics is, you know, they don't know, they're not attracted to taking part. So that leaves about 98% of people who might be up for something quite different. And if you're asking yourself, um, you know, and worrying about the coming age of artificial intelligence, you're worrying about Cambridge Analytica, and you're worried about fake news, then ask yourself, where do you think you've been for these past 200 years? We've never not been manipulated by the elites. We've always been the subject of either propaganda or soft power or you know, huge frameworks within which we all agree certain things that we never had to think about for ourselves. We already have manufactured consent, which is a term I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. We haven't had our own minds. We haven't made up our own minds. We haven't used our own sense of you know, agency at all so far. So really, what we're asking you from the alternative is, is it time for us all to wake up and start to do that? Is that actually what's happening now? Instead of us going more and more passive and losing stuff, is it not the age in which we're beginning to take it back? We could actually completely subvert this question and say, is this the coming age of democracy? And if you're querying my position here, ask yourself, at what point did you actually buy into consumerism, for example? How is it that you managed to agree to spend all your time making money, doing, you know, a lot of us shit jobs, to spend on things we don't really need to impress people we don't really care about? I mean, how did we get into that in the first place? We've been hijacked, we've always been hijacked, and now it's the time for standing up to that. So, and just in case you haven't um, been aware, the amount of money that continues to be spent by governments all over the world to shape your thinking, to give you their version of events, is immense, all right? We all know that hard power is a thing. Uh, we all know how guns and money force people to do things. But few of us are aware of how soft power has always shaped our thinking and shaped our international relations. So countries, national governments, spend billions of pounds putting out propaganda that shapes your thinking about their country. For example, um, I suppose the most obvious example would be China, who's just in the last 10 years set up 850 Confucius Institutes because it's decided how you want to, how they want you to think about China. Now, in my view, they're not doing anything bad, actually. They're actually helping us to understand certain things about China. But it's the amount of money that's being spent to make sure that you are thinking the way that you should be thinking. And that's also coming from the US, it's coming from the UK. The UK spends a lot of money on soft power. So much so that it actually rivals the amount of money we spend on hard power. Something to think about. Could we spend that money differently? In order to, answer the begin, to begin to answer some of these questions, we need to ask ourselves, you know, in this age, it's man against the machine, what is the human being? Ask yourself, 
This is probably one of the most important questions that you need to ask yourself this evening, but in the course of the next 10 years. What is agency? Right? How do you get stuff done? How do you even make your life better? Have you any idea how it is that you can shape your own environment? If you're not beginning to ask these questions for yourself, then you certainly will be um, mastered by the machine. And as a psychotherapist, I can begin to give you a clue as to how you should be looking at this and how we've been shaped until now. Probably the most important thing that we don't think about in a constructive way is what are our emotional needs. And the meaning of that question is what motivates us minute by minute, day by day, right? It's something that we should learn about at school, but we don't learn about this. But the advertising agencies and Cambridge Analytica know this very well. They know how to motivate us, but do you know how you are motivated? This kind of information is really important to you, the individual. Because unless you are the person in charge of how you're getting your needs met, somebody else will get them met for you. Okay, so I'm just going to whiz through them. These next two slides are the mo two most important things that you can know about yourself in the age of AI. So the importance of the attention, of attention, what you give your attention to is absolutely crucial because that's how you learn. We have dreaming brains. We're people who dream. Everything that catches your attention has you in a trance, and starts to program your brain. Right? If you're listening to me properly, I'm now programming you in some way. Okay? If you're not really paying attention, then you're safe. Right? So attention is very, very important. What you give your attention to and how you keep your attention is in your... That's up to you. You've got that. that you own that. You can take your attention away from the things you don't want to give your attention to. You're also driven by a need for status. You're, need, you're driven by a need for belonging. You need your autonomy. We're really driven by a need for autonomy. It's one of the most important things that we have, and that's why I take back control is such a very powerful phrase. We all know we need security. We know we're looking for achievement. Privacy is another very important thing. If you don't find your privacy, there's nowhere for you to be able to reflect. And then meaning and purpose. If you don't have meaning and purpose in your life, and somebody comes along and offers it to you, believe me, you will be very easily hijacked. And intimacy, again, is absolutely crucial. But the great news is, is that you were, you were born with these capacities to, to give all of these things to yourself, right? You actually are, a human being is totally capable of getting these emotional needs by themselves until those needs are corrupted. And those needs have been corrupted, those, sorry, those capabilities and capacities have been corrupted. They've been corrupted by a dysfunctional society, the way we live our lives, the way we do our jobs the way we have no time for ourselves, the way we have no privacy, the way we have no autonomy. We are totally corrupted as human beings. We've lost our ability to manage our own emotions. If you do nothing else... One minute. Okay, yeah, if you do nothing else of these next 10 years, take back your own ability to manage your own emotions and you'll be safe. Okay, just going through that quickly. Something else I can tell you about, but I won't have time now. The upside is, it's my belief that we are actually beginning to wake up. We are beginning to see that fake news is fake news. We are beginning to be able to watch our own behavior on the internet. There is every sense that we're beginning to become conscious of who we are and what we can do. The important things like this, where people actually meet person to person, where they can build trust between them, is one of the key things. And in the political sphere, these kinds of new movements are all about community level, relationship building, trust building, coming together, taking back ownership. And I recommend that you visit the Daily Alternative. And every day we have a new way of being able to win this democracy for the future. Okay, thank you. Just looking to see if there are any spare chairs, but I don't think there are. So, are you okay? Okay, all right. So, um, Nina, over to you now for the second presentation. Well, I'll just have that in, in the background because that speaks a little bit to some of the things that I just want to mention. So, um, my name is, is Nina Densig, and I work at Cardiff University, where I, together with a couple of my colleagues, run something called the Data Justice Lab which was set up very much uh, out of a concern, I guess, with the way in which data is used, increasingly collected, 
and used across our social lives and what this means for ideas of social justice and what it means for notions of equality and fairness, um, autonomy, those kinds of questions. Hence, data justice is what we're trying to contend with, both the sort of the societal implications of datafication, but also um, how uh, we might uh, insert justice concerns within this um, arena. Now, so in this uh, answer to this question as to whether democracy is going to survive in an age of big data and AI, I would say that currently the way that these technologies are being advanced um, is, I would say, a threat to democracy. The nature of these technologies and the way that they are being developed, I think we do need to be uh, concerned about, both in terms of the democratic process itself, as well as in terms of what democracy actually means in terms of equal representation and participation in society. These developments challenge actually both of those uh, aspects of thinking about democracy. But in the 10 minutes I have here, I just want to highlight some of the major challenges that I think we are confronted with. And I come to this question very much from a, you know, I concern myself with issues of governance and issues of citizenship. And so a, a different take, I guess, um, I'm a social scientist, right? So a different take on, on some of these uh, issues. But um, I originally came to this topic out of, a, of some research that I had done on the Snowden leaks, which were leaks that were first published back in 2013, which revealed the extent of digital surveillance programs across a number of different countries, including the United States and the United Kingdom. Now, why is that significant in this context? Well, the nature of the surveillance programs that were revealed by Snowden are important for us here because it was big data surveillance that was revealed in that meaning that those surveillance programs were dependent on a particular political economy of our digital technologies. We have a digital economy that is driven by a business model concerned with the mass collection and analysis of data. And it was this business model that made it possible to exercise or carry out those types of surveillance programs that were revealed in the Snowden leaks. So we need to understand that state governance and economic the business model of digital technologies are, you know, come together in quite a powerful way. And the Snowden leaks brought that to light. Yeah, this is a key insight into what the Snowden leaks actually uh, revealed to us, that we're talking about a particular type of development of digital technologies that have significant implications for how we are also governed. Second important point, I think, to bring to light in terms of the Snowden leaks and what they tell us in this context is the extent to which Data extracting technologies have become normalized in our everyday lives because the technologies that are being used to carry out surveillance programs are actually everyday technologies and engagement that ordinary citizens have in their routine practices. Right? So it's a very normalized part of our lives, the way in which this data is generated. We participate actually quite you know, extensively ourselves in this uh, generation and collection of uh, data. And what we found actually in our research when we looked at things like the media coverage of this is that it's also it's largely justified and normalized in our public debate. And we saw that clearly in the kind of policy debates that we had in the immediate aftermath of the Snowden leaks, particularly the investigatory powers act which was pushed through and very much legalized the sort of things that Snowden had revealed was being carried out. And that's important because when we did research with ordinary citizens of British society, we found that actually there isn't necessarily consent to these practices. In fact, we found that a lot of people expressed concern, a feeling of lack of control, but overwhelmingly felt disempowered to do much about it. So what we identified was what someone like Joe Toro, a professor from the United States, describes as digital resignation. You know, that you feel resigned to the nature of these technologies and you can't do much about it. So even there, we have a key question for what is the state of our democracy when that is the case, both in terms of the public debate and how people feel about what these developments, how these developments are actually being carried out. Now, so what does this mean uh, for um, democracy? So, democracy, well, um, at a very sort of, I think it's important to keep this in mind, at a very basic level, we're dealing with some fundamental questions around what happens to our rights that we hold dear in a liberal democracy, like the right to privacy, for example, or even issues around freedom of expression, which are both sort of challenged when we think about the extensive monitoring 
of our activities that are, are, are being carried out. But I think it goes beyond those types of questions because what we're dealing with is actually a transformation of governance. And that's why I want to highlight some of these uh, developments that we are, we are seeing because with Snowden we were confronted with what was happening in security and intelligence services, but actually the idea of using big data and data analytics is becoming a quite normal practice in lots of ways in which we're being governed. Whether that is our ability to cross a border, our ability to receive benefits and welfare, our eligibility for housing, even if we can get a job and keep a job and be assessed within our job. All of those spaces of our lives are now being having an element, at least, of big data and data analytics and AI to some extent. When we're talking about AI in this context, we're talking about data-driven AI. So, um, and that is now a key, and these stories all speak to some of the areas of our lives that are now implicated by these uh, developments. So Virginia Eubanks, just to recommend a good book on this, has written one called Automating Inequality, for example, where she describes a regime of data analytics that have emerged in public services. Now that is in the context of the United States, but we're seeing some of these developments happening in the United Kingdom uh, as well. Now, in some, in some respects, we're seeing a continuation, of course, of bureaucratization when we're talking about governance in this way, but we're also seeing some significant changes in how governance is being carried out when we start relying on automated decision making and data analytics. And that is, for example, the onus is very much on anticipation and preemption. So there's a temporal shift, if you like, in how we're being governed. Governance is increasingly concerned with trying to preempt behaviors and activities rather than responding to behaviors and activities. And that has implications for how we're governed as citizens because what comes to matter is who we are predicted to be in the future based on lots of group traits, data that's collected to identify group traits based on correlations rather than who we actually are and our lived experiences. And any gap that appears between who we actually are and our lived experiences and that data double becomes very significant, right? And a real question of democracy. So I think this is a, a key way of understanding that we're talking about here, shifting governance in this respect. Um, beyond that, of course, a lot of these technologies, we, we talked about corporate power before, these technologies are overwhelmingly developed by private companies who then contract with government agencies and provide these technologies. This becomes a key question for us, not just in terms of the power that these corporations have to categorize, classify, sort, profile, and ultimately govern us. So we have here also real power shift in terms of where does governance lie with the integration of these technologies. But we also have a question of the fact that there is a lack of transparency in terms of what data is collected, how that data is being used, how decision making is carried out in this space. And that is, Partly because these are proprietary secrets, so companies don't want to reveal what the, the system is, the nature of the system, because that is their business, so they don't want to do that. But of course we also have a question then of accountability, because if governance is going to be carried out off the back of these decision, this type of decision making that is essentially developed in a private space away from the public realm, who is responsible then for that governance? So there's an accountability issue here as well. Um, of course, and a question as to what role do we want corporations to have in our social lives, right? Should they be in these spaces? I think this uh, is also very important to think about. Um, and then finally, but just I don't know how much time I have. Two minutes. Then I want to just touch on some of the responses we're seeing because I think we're also here and in this debate perhaps going to talk a bit about ethics, the role of ethics, because of course, what I've talked about introduces some ethical challenges. And what we're seeing, I think, emerge is a response uh, to some of these developments. We're having, in, in the UK, we have a number of ethics bodies being set up to challenge some of these, or at least to consider some of the challenges of these developments. But we're also having the tech industry itself reacting in this way by setting up associations concerned with ethics and the ethics of these technologies. And I do think we have to be alert to what is happening also in this space because we need to always remind ourselves that the definition of what ethics is in this space and who gets to decide what it is is also going to be a struggle because tech companies want to define 
issues of fairness or discrimination or bias that are inherent in many of these systems as simply a technological problem that you can therefore solve with a technological solution. I think we need to push back on this and say that actually these technologies are contingent upon a certain political and economic context and the discussion needs to be about that. We cannot narrow or neutralize these issues into simply being a question of technology because the challenges we're facing go far beyond that. Finish that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That, that was a great speech. That was two great speeches and, and really opened to that for us. Anyhow, David, now you all know David, most of you know David, he's spoken many times in the land of the futurists, and he's got the challenge of doing this in 10 minutes. So indeed, two very interesting and very important uh, perspectives already on this question of big data and democracy. As you heard, my name is David Wood. You can find me online on Twitter at DW2. Amongst other things, I chair London Futurists, where I want to have more of this kind of discussion urgently, deeply, and with many perspectives. Another hat that I wear is that I am a big fan of democracy, and I'm a big fan of big data. It shouldn't really be a versus. It shouldn't be, well, do we have to have one or the other? Ideally, it should be both. But if I look ahead to what I'm going to say in the very last slide, I think it is inevitable in due course. If we manage things well, if we manage things right, it's inevitable that big data, augmented by artificial intelligence, probably will become smarter and more profound, and we should be looking in due course, perhaps the middle of this century, to AI taking more and more decisions with the full approval of us as humans. It will be disastrous if this transfer of power happens at the wrong time, when we're not ready for it, when big data and artificial intelligence are still anything like in its current immature, heavily biased format. But if it can have full human approval, and I mean the approval basically of every human with a full understanding of this, then it could be good, very good indeed. Let me try and talk about democracy a bit. Democracy has had its critics for a long time, of course. This gentleman here, some of you may recognize him as the second president of the United States, the vice president of George Washington. He was quite ambivalent about how good democracy was. He wrote in a letter in 1814, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. In the case you didn't get the point, he lines up, there never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. But since then, democracy, I guess, has gone up in public reputation for a while, but in recent times, it seems to be going down again. If we look at figures from the Human Values Survey, what's happening here is different countries around the world People have been asked the question, how many of you agree that a democratic political system is a bad or a very bad way of governing your country? And each different country, the figures are arranged by decade of birth, and by and large the older folks think that democracy is pretty good and important, but increasingly young people in some countries, there's the USA, it's uh, more than 20% think it's a bad or a very bad way to govern the country. Why are people disenchanted with democracy? Well, I think we all know the reasons. We see that the outcomes of democratic votes seem to leave a lot to be desired. And we think, well, somehow the voters have made decisions without having a really good understanding of these issues. In part, because voters aren't that incentivized to do deep research. It's not like when you're trying to buy a, an expensive product, you spend a long time figuring out what the pros and cons are here. Most people think their votes don't really matter that much anyway. They're living in a safe constituency, and anybody they would like to vote for, doesn't, they're not on the ballot box. So people aren't incentivized to vote that much. And then there's the other drawback of democracy, which is that voters are often bribed, directly or indirectly, by promises and tax handouts and other things that politicians do with an eye on the short term, when perhaps it would be better for all of us if they had more of an eye on the long term. So it's no surprise that many people around the world, 
Not in every country yet, but in more and more countries are saying, maybe democracy isn't the best way to manage things. Maybe we should take a leaf out of what? To China. China, they don't mess around. They take the decisions which are best for the next 10 years. And there are some people in America, I saw there was somebody called Donald Trump who said, you know what Xi Jinping has done? Maybe we should do the same thing and elect a dictator for life. Now, I am a fan of democracy, a big fan of democracy. I think it's important to understand what's so important about democracy. And I like what this gentleman here, Tony Benn, said, who spoke many times in this building, Conway Hall. He was a member of parliament for nearly 50 years, with just a short exception. He had a phrase about the importance of democracy. It's all about being able to get rid of the people who are currently in power. If you can't get rid of the people who govern you, you do not live in a democratic system. And it may be that the people we vote in start off with being great parliamentarians. But after a while, there's this thing that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So Tony Benn continues, no one with power really likes democracy. That's why every generation must struggle to win it and keep it, including ours. But why is democracy so important? In part, so we can keep pushing people out of power when they have gone past their cell by date. In part, as in the words of this gentleman, Joseph Rayner Stevens, who probably didn't speak at Conway Hall or his predecessors, although he had sentiments that would have fitted in here fine in the 1830s. He was a supporter of Chartism. He has a nice turn of phrase that the democracy, the question of universal suffrage, is a knife and fork question. It is a bread and cheese question. Unless people have the vote, they will not have the other rights that come with being an equal member of society. As he said, by universal suffrage, I mean that every working man, I guess he was a creature of the 1830s, has a right to have a good coat on his back, a good roof for the shelter of the household, and so forth. But as I said, democracy has not been living up to that particularly. There are major issues with democracy, which, alas, if we're not careful, big data is going to make worse. We're ending up with entities that are too powerful to be removed from power, despite the fact that there seems to be a system of elections which allows some changing of the guard. So people point to big finance, the banks that are too big to fail, big corporations, used to be the big oil corporations as well as the big banks, now it's the big tech corporations. Can we really turn them off or dissuade them? Eisenhower, the former general who became the president of the US, talked about the military industrial complex, which if we're not careful would be too big to control and would escape democratic oversight. And there are many other complexes, media titans, and then, as I mentioned, there's a case of good Democrats going bad. People that initially were very happy to have taking decisions for us. We like what we do until it's too late, and then it's no longer within our power to remove them. And then increasingly in this decade and the next decade, it's the tech giants who are taking decisions increasingly based on their surveys of big data and AIs. Could big data come to our rescue here? In principle, yes. In principle, big data should be allowing open data access so that all the information which is there is not just kept for a few large corporations or a few political powerful, powerful politicians to keep. It should be available for public review. It should be organized in the manner of Wikipedia to enable collective intelligence. Ideally, AI will alert us when we are having the wool pulled over our eyes, when there is fake news. Just as currently when I'm typing a document, my word processor will helpfully underline in red the words I'm misspelling, in due course it will underline purple perhaps the things that I'm saying that are factually incorrect and the things others are saying. Two minutes, David. So that's the positive potential. But there are vulnerabilities too. And this big data and analysis, if it doesn't go to the citizens as a whole, can, as has been referred to by the previous speakers, could become the basis for people manipulating us in ways even more extensive than before. So if I summarize, where we are today, I sometimes call politics 1.0, which politics is far from perfect, democracy is often captured, the regulations that apply to new technologies is often out of date or poorly administered by politicians who are out of their depths. 
And electors are often out of their depths too, so it is hard for us electors to make decisions. But if we hide the technology driving a better politics, sharing more data, sharing the understanding, we could end up with a real wisdom of crowds, real-time fact-checking, we could have artificial intelligence boosting our human systems of artificial in in intelligence, and we could end up with enlightened electors, and increasingly enlightened politicians who will have to respect a higher caliber of discussion. But at the same time, there is the risk that that same technology could be used for ulterior motives, ending up with mass surveillance, mass distraction, government by the 1%, for the 1%, electors deceived more than ever before. We've moved from the current situation of mediocrity, not to where I think we should reach, which is a world of insight, but instead increasingly to a world which we are, alas, seeing of anger and violence. So if I summarise, if I look at three timescales ahead, the next one or two years, perhaps the next five years, a medium scale time scale, five to 15 years, and then a 15 to 30 year period, we could in each case see either bad use of big data and AI or good use. In the short term, if we're not careful, we'll see more surveillance and fake news and democracy manipulated even more than before. But if we do get in trouble with it, we have real-time fact-checking and we can de-bias the algorithms which are currently misleading us. In the medium term, I don't have time to say much about this, there are risks of humans being displaced from the workforce, growing inequalities, benefits going to the 1% winners rather than to everybody. If, on the other hand, we sort out our politics and our society, we have the potential for this automation to power a sustainable abundance with benefits shared to everybody. Longer term, as the general intelligence of artificial systems moves into superhuman levels, if we're not careful, the bulk of humans will be sidelined out and live a pitiful existence. But if we do it right, we can uplift humanity to, I call it humanity plus. The differentiation between these two outcomes depends on, first, are these systems of data and analytics really widely understood? It is absolutely in all of our interest to make sure that this is not a secret, it is not something hidden, it is something widely discussed. We have to avoid some knee-jerk reactions which, guided by our previous instincts, no longer apply. We need instead to analyze these potential future scenarios pretty carefully, highlighting the need to turn sometimes quite quickly to steer towards the really positive scenarios such as the one I call sustainable abundance for all, which I've written up at some length from the Transpolitical website. So if we are smart enough, we'll have many, many more people squeezing into this room, or maybe not this room, but this building, in the future, engaging in the same conversation. We need this conversation to go global, we need it to be well informed, and we need it to be guided by an awareness of what can go wrong, but also an awareness of what can go right. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to open it up now. I'll come over here and use this, so maybe you can share this between you. Right, let's put this down. Um, yeah, this is where we open it up to everyone else. Um, we'll have a couple of two or three rules, first of all. Um, one is I never ask people to ask a second question when there are people with their hands up still who haven't asked their first question. Secondly, if you do ask a question, please don't ask any more than a couple. Don't ask five or six, or you take time away from other people. Finally, if you want to make comments, that's okay. But please, please don't turn them into speeches. Um, and then we can give everyone a chance. So they're rules of fairness more than anything else. Okay. So, we're going to now open this up for you to take your part, to have your say, to ask questions, to make comments. Who is going to be the brave person to start? Okay. Let's both do it. Um, my name is John Preston. The word in my mind is the word reform. And to get from the world we have now into the world they're describing of AI, it's going to be a lot of reform. A, how we control AI, and how we develop democracy to keep the people in touch with it. As a recent talk, I contradicted the speaker because I said it's a, almost a norm that institutions find it very difficult to reform themselves. So I'm putting the word how back into your minds, and I'm interested to hear your answers. 
Okay, well let's take that one. I won't take everyone for each question, but the idea of institutions reforming themselves is difficult. And if you have Google and Facebook and Amazon, how the heck are you going to reform them and do really what you want, have accountability? Let's take that with you first. Um, so, uh, first of all, I think, I don't know, understand, uh, so at the t on the t if we're going to have genuine, um, so I agree that there is a, a real um, problem for a particularly public sector institutions to feel empowered to challenge the terms upon which they have to integrate these technologies, and that is a real issue, and one of the reasons for that is because we're dealing with monopolies, as it's been pointed out, so I think we should have one thing on the table, which we should break up these companies, they should not be allowed to be monopolies. Um, secondly, um, I do think that we need to, so that's some work that I'm trying to do with my colleagues as well, is that we are not in a situation now where it is completely uncontrolled. There is potential for intervention. And some of the things that we need to do, particularly when we're talking about uh, these kinds of areas where we're looking at the introduction of big data and AI into, uh, for example, issues around uh, welfare and eligibility for housing and those kinds of questions, which is what's happening now, is that actually frontline staff and practitioners themselves also need to be empowered to push back on some of these developments when they think they don't work, or at least to understand how they work so that they can challenge when decisions are ori or uh, doesn't um, fit the context in which they're working in. So I do think that there is actually, you can pinpoint uh, intervention points, and we need to be much harder on these companies that they shouldn't be monopolies. Okay, David. I think, John, you're entirely right. There are very large changes that are going to be needed, uh, perhaps bigger and faster changes than have uh, taken place at almost any time in history. This is uh, an issue that requires a great deal of our collective attention. And you're entirely right that uh, the inertia which sets in in any organisation, it follows processes that made it successful in the past. And often these processes are no longer the right ones for the future. How can we break this? First of all, sometimes with uh, setting up new parallel institutions, and then Indra will talk about the Alternative UK as a new platform which can maybe change faster and do things more quickly than existing platforms. So if the United Nations is going too slowly, then we can set up an alternative uh, thing that's a little bit like some of the aspects of the United Nations, for example. Also, we can speed things up with a more powerful vision, which includes both a vision of what can really be good and what can also go wrong. It needs to have both. If it's just a fearful vision, then it will diminish us, us psychologically. But with a positive, powerful vision of things, something like sustainable abundance, we can get more people standing up and saying, you know what, this is a wartime scenario. You know, I'm going not going to take three years to do this. I'm going to do it in two weeks instead of putting normally three years. And I think that kind of change could be possible. Yeah, I'm uh, very in favor of the different forms of democracy that we see you were describing, David. I think nothing changes until we move into a new era of democracy. Right? And what that requires is for people who care to step up and start to become active citizens. If you don't count yourself into the process, you won't get heard. You know, who is the we here? Say, say you want something to happen. You can want as much as you like, but who's going to act on your behalf? You know, we have, you know, the only kind of reform that is likely is the democratic reform that people can count themselves into something that helps them to get heard. If you think about it, Occupy named the 99%. How on earth did the 99% get to be enthralled to the 1%? One day we'll look back at that and say, how, how did we have a whole century you know, of people, 99% of the people believing they had no power? How, we'll look back at that one day, you know, because we will have the tools to make ourselves better express, but we have to demand them and then we have to step up. For me, that is the, that is the key change that needs to happen. Okay, uh, let's see if we have a, a lady who wants to ask a question. So we've got a gender balance, anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I guess my question is a little bit about what the book we just uh, talked about. One is about the intellectual capability that we need to operate people to, and the other is the emotional <clears throat> and psychological capability to not just bring the early adopters, because we're the early adopters, but we need to get the maths involved. So how do we make that shift so we can get true democracy? 
Okay, then let's start. I won't ask all of you to answer each question. We obviously won't get as many questions as we want. So, if you want to take that, because that's quite an interesting question for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you're pointing at two huge gaps there, and so we just have to start, right? And the way that we see it being possible, and where most of the acti activity is happening at the moment, is at the community level. So, at the community level, can people come together, um, become aware of what they don't know, so to speak? So. You know, we're talking about community laboratories, learning clubs. Yes, we all have to get up to speed. What Peter was talking about, uh, sorry, what David was talking about when he said, uh, we're not really up to it yet. That's the truth. None of us are up to it yet. Our politicians are not up to it. We don't really know how to run a globe. There's a lot of learning to be done and we need the help of AI. But how we own that is our thing. So I would say learning, learning clubs, community hubs, you know, there are, let's, let's acknowledge what we don't have. And as far as emotional control is concerned, that's, that's definitely available. You know, this is actually what the internet is already offering, a lot of that self-development stuff. Okay, um, Clive next. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm Thanks very much, interesting talks. There was never a mention of blockchains, decentralized ledgers and the centralization of power versus decentralized power. And it seems to me that the issue of democracy is about centralization of power. They put up a load of threats to democracy, such as banking, military, industrial complex, the media, etc. Um, our research, critical thinking, suggests that's all vested in the same hands, controlled by the same people. So what technology needs to be and this is my question for you, where does big, big data fit in to the blockchain decentralization and um, decentralized ledgers? Okay, do you want to hear, okay, this blockchain, the answer to how you get it back to control the data? Uh, something uh, related to blockchain might be the answer. Um, I'm toying actually with setting a London Futurist meeting soon on the future of blockchain. I haven't quite decided whether it's uh, appropriate to bring the members out on a sa sunny Saturday afternoon in the middle of the summer to do that or not, but uh, many people ask. I think that uh, we're still at a very early stage in understanding blockchain, I think. 95% of the claims that are made for blockchain are false, but maybe 5% of them are true. And it's figuring out what that 5% is true. I am absolutely in favour of uh, sharing data and uh, avoiding data being hidden and wrapped up. And I'm in favour of algorithms being uh, shared as well. I'm not yet convinced that uh, all the libertarian instincts of the initial blockchain community are entirely appropriate. I think we need some elements of centralised control too. I'm not opposed to centralised control. I just want that centralised control to be democratically uh, administered rather than uh, happening uh, without any state at all. Okay, I mean, Neil, did you want to say anything? Um, I'll just say, again, so I mean, there's an interesting, Barcelona is an interesting case for uh, using um, blockchain technology to try and facilitate more democratic participation and decentralized control. So I think there's some, definitely some interesting things happening that we could probably learn from in that, uh, that space. I just wanted to say on the awareness and literacy question because I do think we have to be a bit harder on these tech companies because they deliberately obscure some of these processes. I mean, privacy agreements are pages long, etc., etc. I mean, this is a deliberate act for people not to be literate in this space. So I think we can also force them to be much more transparent about their practices. We do have data protection regulation in place that demands some of these things, we could push that further. So I think the literacy element also needs to come from demanding those who hold this power to make themselves more visible and transparent. And so it goes both ways. Okay, David, if you do anything on blockchain, I'm sure we'll be interested in that. We're going to do a webinar, I think, uh, at some time on blockchain and digital health, which is an area that's developing. Okay, you had a question. Uh, I was just wondering if any of you had read Democracy Squared at all? And um, if not, it's a book that talks about well, the principles of uh, democratizing democracy and one of the applications that someone is using in Australia is uh, using a smartphone app called, I think, MyGov or YouGov or something to send legislative bills to an app which people can then vote independently for um, if they need any more information or depth, they can click on links to research that, etc. So they have all the information at their fingertips. 
and then by a certain date, I think they have to vote. And I think it's been experimented with on a really low level and is actually being trialled. But I wonder if you've seen something like that in the UK or if you think it's an effective way of... Is that called NetSquare? Sorry? NetSquare, did you say? I think democracy no, it's called oh, democracy, democracy, democracy Square. Democracy Square, yeah. Um, and I just wanted to get your opinion on what you think that's a step forward in trying to return power back to the people on the voting box. So I'm not familiar with that particular book, I've just looked it up. Democracy <laughs> Squared, a digital revolution that's about to democratise democracy. Authors John Barnes and others. It looks interesting. It's the kind of thing I very much would like to see happening. I do see many of these initiatives say, starting with a blaze of good enthusiasm and then uh, running out of steam, in part because it's hard work, in part because there isn't a commercial business case to back them up often, and uh, people then start working instead on apps with a more commercial flavour, which is a great shame. I think public funds should be made available to uh, encourage this kind of thing. I will look that book up. You were nodding your head, maybe you know something about democracy I'm going to take it as a principle of uh, faster democracy, liquid democracy. Um, and there's a lot of liquid democracy experiments going on, and I think, let's experiment, let's keep experimenting, but it shouldn't happen without the counterpart, which is more meeting and more relationship. You know, most of our mistakes uh, are coming from our disconnectedness, us are not really understanding each other, how, how things work properly. And uh, I'll give you a little bit, um, sorry for it, so there was a, a survey done recently about uh, how people see each other, so value, value surveys, and 60% of people here think uh, that they are compassionate people. But when asked about other people, they think that at least 60 to 70% of other people are not compassionate. So this is the sort of stuck that we're in. We've been convinced by the media and by our political narratives that other people are dangerous and unfriendly, even though we're not. And so there's quite a lot that we have to awake from. This idea of the other is, you know, it's, it's the absolute key to a more successful democracy. So if we just try to rely now on pushing buttons, we're not going to get to that part. And the, that part is key to a better democracy, which is more relationship, more understanding of each other and the human being. Okay, is there any, yeah, lady? Um, on that point, um, it has always been that human stories are distressful with other humans. And I feel like with big tech companies and big sort of media online, it shows more danger. So how do we get to a place of compassion for each other when I feel like technology is making it more compassionless? I mean, if you want to take that, because you've been dealing with big companies, um, how, yeah. how do you equate your corporate control with individuals having compassion? Yeah, it's difficult because it seems that we're, are we, you know, that's, is that a question of big data or is that a question of something else? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it's, um, I don't know if I have a particularly, uh, how we become more compassion, you know, how we express more compassion to each other. It's not something I've done particular research on. I, um, I don't know that I, I can speak to that particularly, but I think it's more of your yeah. kind of area. Okay. Yeah. It's a bit of a, just a quick um, add on, isn't it, really? Um, I'm not sure we have to become more compassionate towards each other. I think we have to realise that we are compassionate for each other. That's a very different thing. And that if we don't come into some sort of relationship with each other, we won't discover that. I mean, most of our discoveries, political discoveries, since we've been doing our um, alternative, is the humanity that is really out there. You know, and that technology d could divide us from each other further, because it's just about opinion. Right? Opinion is not the thing that brings us together, it's meaning, purpose, belonging, all these other things we're looking for. So opinion is not enough to build a democracy, but it, but it could be really useful once we have got that kind of relationship with each other, to have great means of sharing our thoughts and feelings. 20 seconds for me. I think our instinct to trust isn't always uh, universally good, it can be misled and misused. So. Rather than saying uh, trust is the most important skill or better attribute, I'd say the ability to build trust and then verify trust. So Reagan's phrase, trust but verify, is actually very important. We need better mechanisms to build trust and then verify. And if we can do that, then many of the gaps that uh, uh, frustrate progress might be overcome. Okay, gentlemen, at the end there. Yeah. Trust. Okay, can we take the gentleman over here? He's had to find out. Uh, 
A bit of a uh, devil's advocate question. In my adult voting life, I'm now 68, I have never had a local councillor for whom I voted, a local council that I voted for, an MP that I voted for, a government of the colour that I voted for, or a head of state that I voted for. Mm -hmm. I don't live in a democracy. Anything's better, including anarchy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, we'll take that as a statement, and Terry, you can have your Yes, I, um, I went to the doctor the other day, and I'm usually late, asked to see me, not the other way around. And after all the blood tests and this health check, they said, Mr. Lone, there is a 14.4% chance that you will have a cardiac event within the next 10 years. And I thought, what does the point for me? <laughs> and the reason I can tell this story is because nobody, I don't think, tonight has questioned the usefulness of huge amounts of data. You see, if X amount of data is of a certain amount of use, it doesn't follow that 10 times X is 10 times as useful. And I've written down three words that the speaker, the speaker said. He talked about compassion, he talked about disconnectedness, and I've forgotten the exact words, but I think in your talk, you talked about the difference between who, uh, between our lived lives and what the people with power want to imagine us doing with all the data. My question, 91 years after Heisenberg first raised this, are there limits to measurements? Is the whole obsession with big data silly? Okay, I mean, Nina, take that, but also take it with that point I made right at the beginning, that big data, means you have a lot of data and some may be useless. But big data also allows us to measure what people want better than democracy. If you have so much data coming through Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, and you analyze it, you know what a neighborhood that what, uh, wants better than if they vote for it and better if they do opinion poll. So I think, uh, I, I think there are two points to make. One is, I do think that we need to, um, there is something called uh, what is the value of quantifying social life? What counts as social life? And I do think that we need to question the extent to which, because big data can only capture what can be measured. So it also therefore cannot capture a huge amount of complexity in our lives. And if we're going to start relying only on what can be measured to make decisions about incredibly complex social lives, we are missing something, right? So that is one point. The other thing is to say, AI in particular is not about simply extracting information, it's about optimization, meaning that it's not just about a representation of our lives as they are, it's about shaping us in a particular way, right? So it's not just about gathering information, it's also about shaping behavior. So we have to see in both those terms that these systems are optimized to get you to behave or activities to be in a certain way. So uh, that's why I'm uh, critical of it in a more sort of, I guess, philosophical sense as well. And I take your point that there are things outside of what can be measured. So how do you respond to that, Indra? I mean, if big data is about shaping behaviour, how can you shape your own behaviour? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just agree with the general trend of that, of that discussion. Um, and because we've always been that way. I mean, that's what I was trying to underline at the beginning. You know, it's not new. You know, we've lived in, in a public space in which the people with power have been shaping us until now. That's why we do the things we do mostly, I have to say. If you look at why, what kind of decisions did you make? Did, did anybody ask you if you wanted to do your O-levels, your A-levels, your GCSEs, you know, whatever it is called today? No. You know, we always have been shaped and decided for by someone that doesn't ask our opinion. So this is... What, you know, I think what I'm trying to say is we can really turn it around and think about you know, this moment in this era as the first time that we could start to have a democracy. It's the first moment. And sorry to the gentleman at the end, in terms of you never voted for, the sorts of um, you know, new things that are going on now at the local level are exactly addressing your question. You know, because only 30% of people do actually vote for a local council. 70% of people don't. Why? Because they don't recognize what that council's doing. They don't recognize their part, their political party. But there's quite a new phenomenon now of communities coming together as a community, shape, creating their own party that actually represents the community. And, that, and they're now being voted in little pockets around the country. It's called flat pack democracy. 
I recommend you read it. We well, did a webinar on flat hat yeah. and see what it's was yeah. pretty good. Thank you. So I want to speak up for data since data's taking a bit of a battering in the last 10 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. It's true that uh, sometimes data is uh, overanalyzed, but sometimes we need to pay attention to data. For example, when David Nutt, the former chief uh, advisor to the government on uh, drugs, when he pointed out that uh, uh, riding a horse was much, much more dangerous to your health than taking cannabis, when he pointed out that alcohol was a much more dangerous drug than, uh, I think, LSD, then the data, he had data to back him up, but right? it wasn't just instinct or wishful thinking. And that's the kind of data that should be taken into account. There are many myths in society not just myths about drugs, but myths about all kinds of things which good data undermines. And Stephen Pinker's excellent recent book, uh, Enlightenment, uh, in which he looks at the vast surveys of data, points out there are many mid wide misunderstandings. And we don't need to go into the second or third decimal point, it's just often an order of magnitude. So that is the data which should be more widely shared. Uh, information about this, the power of the tech corporations, the fact that they are now the wealthiest co corporations in the world, something they weren't particularly keen for us to know. But, so that is also a data that should be raised up and highlighted. And then, of course, we have the decision. So what? But unless we have that information, we will be taking our decisions totally blind. Rather than, uh, and we should not just operate on our instinct. We need the wisdom of data together with the wisdom of humanity. Okay. Good. Very good. I was just said, data yeah. and big data is not the same thing. I mean, I rely on data for my research on Big data is about predictive analytics, so that's the, that's the key thing. Okay, Mr. Edward. Uh, I just had a question, I guess, mainly for the, for the gentleman in the middle, about you listed a number of threats to, or, or massive challenges to actual democratic life. Um, and I was intrigued whether on that list of threats like big corporations or all the rest of it, a big government, say, based somewhere in Belgium, might be one of those kind of threats, taking power more away from people towards uh, a larger institution. You are not introducing Brexit into this. <laughs> <laughs> Big government. Big government is absolutely a threat. Many times uh, governments have started well-meaning and then they've ended up uh, constraining innovation and straight tracking people. Um, so we need to have a vibrant government. I'm not a fan of big government. I'm a favour of the right size of government, government that's well-informed and has democratic oversight. Okay, any ladies who have not asked? Lady back here. Uh, thank you very much for an uh, interesting talk. So I think I'm kind of back on the pro data camp, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, so my point was sort of related to the Australian phone app and also the point raised that perhaps sometimes voters aren't motivated to research everything about every issue that we're voting on because there's so much information, everyone's only got so much time. So my point is that is it not possible to perhaps envisage a future where AI can be used to empower voters in so much as um, what AI is really good at is what's the competitive stuff. So in my, um, in my research area of material science, some AI technologies have been developed that can process thousands of research papers and then extract information on making materials. So similarly, we not envisage a future in which um, AI can be used to make a situation where you can't be politically manipulated and you can't be lied to because all the information is there and knowledge is power. Okay, David, do you think that? How can AI be used to empower people? So there's something called liquid democracy, which may or may not be covered in that book about this earlier circumstance. Liquid democracy is when you give your vote or your representation, not just to one person, but to a group of people. Currently today, you end up with one member of parliament who's meant to be representing you in all things. And you might agree with that party on one or two of their policies, but not on many others. How do they know which of the policies you really care about or not? So with liquid democracy, you don't have to research everything in detail. In fact, that's an impossibility, there's so much. But each person can say, well, you know what, on the issues of um, uh, climate change, I trust this person. On the issues of healthcare, I trust this person. On the issues of a, a drug uh, legalization, I trust this person. And so the liquid uh, democracy is one way that, in which that can be sorted out. So that's one step in the right direction. How, how would uh, how would liquid democracy benefit from AI? I don't understand that connection. So AI is also able to analyze arguments. So this is, you're right, it's moving on to the next step. So the AI is maybe, not today, but in due course, it's going to be able to point out uh, flaws in reasoning. Not just it's going to be able to say this fact is dubious, but it's going to be able to say, well, this person has made this argument. Actually, this what he has said is correct, and this what he has said is correct, but this conclusion does not follow. And it's going to throw in other things into that mix as well. So it'll be a little bit like 
what? Uh, the spam detection mechanism that we already have. Sometimes you're about to click on a link and a bit of our software says don't click on it. You may think it's from your best friend, it's not actually from your best friend. So a little, the AI in the future will, I think, be acting as a guardian angel in that sense. Very dangerous, of course, because it's not really a guardian angel. If it's a demon disguised as a guardian angel, it'll lead us further down the garden path. But if we can get it right, it will, it, and we can really trust it, we can figure out by ourselves it's something we should trust. The best piece of technology we have, in my, in my belief, is, is the human being, right? And that hasn't been really explored, you know, for all its potential at all. Right, so we should always keep that in mind when we're looking at what's on the what's on the horizon. Uh, you you talked about people not having enough time. Well, not, well, not perceiving having enough time. Yeah, well, or perceiving not to have enough time, but in reality, we don't have enough time. We you know we expect ourselves to work at jobs ten hours a day. You know we don't make time for these things that really matter. So if you're looking into the future of the 21st century, there's a lot of uh, you know, important blocks that have to change. One of them is to be able to have more time to do the things that matter. And one of, uh, you know, and in that time that we have, we should be able to learn more. But I just want to draw your attention to one other thing, which is citizens' assemblies. It's a piece of technology, I don't know if you're aware of, um, which, which allow groups of people to do, to deliberate, you know, very difficult, thorny problems, political problems. And they are chosen randomly from a community or from a country. Uh, like, like citizens' juries. Um, and they spend time deliberating over a problem, getting all the information they need. Maybe not everyone will have the time, but the citizens', ju uh, citizens assemblies model is a very good one for using human, human wisdom uh, to, to solve difficult problems. We, we've also done several other nice citizens' assemblies, mm -hmm. the abortion campaign, and I understand that as well. Um, yeah, so I'm probably going to say quite a lot of people. Um, first of all, I think it's unwise just to consider AI democracy. I think that's a good that AI has an impact on all sectors in the way we work and play together. Particularly education. I think that is the starting point of how you start to get people to start thinking critically, for sure. Every bit of data you see, you suspect, and you think about it. Why did they say that? Who said that? And what are they trying to tell you? So you start thinking for, the, for everyone, I'm not talking about the top 10%, the 100% of people must be trained, know themselves, to be able to think critically and do everything else. Also working together, and that is very true. Capitalism, you cannot really consider positive democracy without considering how you generate wealth. That is critical to everything. And I believe this is where AI could be a huge benefit to us, for sure. We should all work together in partnerships, be it public or private. Partnerships, transparent partnerships, work together. And finally, and the big one, is we have to change the way we do democracy, because we don't do it well, for sure. And you mentioned citizen assemblies. Okay, they're a bolt-on to a system of democracy. What you need to do is get a citizen assembly in parliament. They're the ones who make the decisions. That means the end of politicians, as we know them, and end of voting. That is an AI in the system, all those things. And that's what we should think about. Well, all uh, if, if AI can in the system in all those things, that's great. But Nina is, is a social scientist. How important is it to develop critical thinking as a way of bringing AI into some sort of perspective? Yeah, of course, it's very important. Uh, of course, we can. Uh, I agree that uh, having increasing literacy is is absolutely um, a big part of this. I work in a journalism school. I'm not a journalism scholar myself, but I work with journalism educators, and one of the things we're trying to do with them is also to increase our reporting on this because this is a huge lack. We don't actually have particularly uh, good watchdogs uh, on these developments at the moment, partly because. And this is just to sort of say, it's incredibly difficult to research these developments. I'll just uh, say that it's not so, it's sort of trans, but it's straightforward just to say, okay, we need to know more about this. It's actually very difficult because it's happening in a space where there are actually particular interests that are guiding these developments. And so for me, it doesn't make so much sense to sort of say AI good, AI bad, because it's happening in a particular context and we need to consider that context if we're going to have this discussion. And what we're dealing with is, Good or bad isn't really relevant, it's a transformation. And I'm talking about uh, democracy here, not just in terms of voting, but in terms of how people are able to participate in society you and the terms upon which... You don't need to vote. Yeah. Right? Well, but we've got, I've, that my 
you know, understanding of democracy. By the way, I'm a Swedish citizen, so I'm not voting in this country anyway. But I think, um, I think that sort of my, my entry point into this is what are the terms upon which people are allowed to participate and be represented in society? And that is what is transforming. And so, yes, of course, we can have AI for good things if we want to look at it in these terms, but it's happening in this context that we're dealing with in today, and that's what we have to face up to. So I think that's where I come at it from. Okay, this lady here. Um, so, thank you for the presentation. I, I guess I'm an economist, so for me, the connection between AI and democracy is very much about jobs. And I see um, these events like Brexit and Trump um, and all these things that have been, uh, you know, have thrown these questions into, or, you know, thrown the whole democracy thing into question. And for me, I see that as people feeling a lot of anxiety about their jobs so we're, we stand to lose about like half a million jobs in the next five years to self-driving cars, and that's only the beginning of where machine learning and artificial intelligence is headed. And so um, there's a lot of kind of optimism of what will happen when humans don't have to do mundane work anymore, that they get creative and you know innovate. Um, but you know, in the short term, most of us are going to be jobless, and we've been completely disembedded, like disembedded from our food production, from land ownership, water ownership. So what is going to happen? Are we going to have Star Wars in the next 10 years? Like we're going to have Tesla up here, and the rest of us are going to be like digging for food in the sand? OK, David. I mean, are we going to have, because of AI, a huge underclass? A majority of people, possibly, with no jobs, or very few jobs, a big economy, real problems, and of social security. So in my last slide, I did have a, a, mid, a middle time period in which I said maybe 10 to 15 years time we face exactly this scenario in which AI will have become more mature, uh, more reliable, it will do creative tasks as well as just raw uh, repetitive tasks, it will do compassionate tasks, it will do managerial tasks. That's a credible scenario for the future in my view, but I can't uh, establish that argument just in a few minutes now. But to cut a long story short, I think this is very much a possibility. And there are two outcomes. One is that it'll just be very good for the 1% who happen to own these corporations. Uh, Lena argues we should uh, break them up, and uh, I think it's a strong case for that. But if they manage to resist being broken up, then they may be by far the most powerful entities that ever operated on the planet, and they will take the, the, they'll be by far the richest. And then the rest of us will have almost nothing to do. But we can also see this uh, huge possibility as being more like the Star Trek economy, which is that there's no need for money, and that things uh, generated by automation will become cheaper and more affordable. It won't just be a basic income, it'll be universal prosperity for all. It's not going to happen by default. If we continue on the existing trajectory, as Lena said, we'll end up in a very uh, uh, dissatisfying uh, outcome. And the further we go down that track, the worst will come for nearly all of us, and we will have possibly the biggest uh, social alienation ever. Now, maybe we'll all be given the equivalent of drugs, uh, soma, as a uh, half heartedly forecast, or, uh, forecast by Aldous Huxley in the brave new world, and maybe we'll be content to an extent, but I don't think so. I think the human uh, psyche will rebel, and it will be something absolutely terrible for that to come about. So, so yeah, I mean, do you have that idealistic view in the long term? Like, to get to the long term, will we ever get through the short term? Uh, yeah, I think this is. I think this is a really huge challenge. So I uh, thank you for bringing uh, it uh, up. And I think um, there is a reason. That I think it's very interesting. Is the Silicon Valley is very pro universal basic income because they envision this uh, future and wants to make sure that the state will subsidize uh, everybody so that they don't have to um, do that. But I think. Uh, I think what we. Uh, yeah, I would like to be optimistic. I think at some point, perhaps people will actually rebel on this area. Do you think if you have mass unemployment, then you know society is not uh, stable? But I think before that, I think what's interesting at the moment is we shouldn't lose sight of how um, you know AI is actually being introduced into existing uh, labor conditions at the moment, which are basically used to suppress labor costs and create precarity. We see that in the gig economy a lot. So there's a lot to organize around at the moment. So we don't have to just focus on the future and so the future. There's really a lot to do right now because these systems are being used to advance, you know, are quite, um, and that is happening actually. We're fighting back against, you know, for example, Uber and, and the likes now, right? So I think we are seeing positive developments happening in this space as well, but there's a lot to you know, focus on that's right now also. Yeah.
Okay. Um, just, I don't know how this is coming because I don't want to do a second question. I'll be able to hear until other people who didn't have a second question. Um, just to let you know, we finish at 8.15, so we've got half an hour. We might not get everyone in, so I'll do my best. I know that you've had your hands up for some time. Um, I've uh, got to the end of the life of active politics. I seem to have spent most of my life uh, knocking on uh, mm. doors and doing democracy on people's doorsteps. The only place where democracy is done is on the top deck of a Clapham omnibus with people reading the tabloid newspapers. And the sum of all of this is that voters are highly prejudiced people with long-held, uh, often irreversible views. You don't go and knock on someone's front door and change their views during an election run-up and get them to vote for your party rather than the party they've always voted for. And this is happening in, uh, in, in the, the new Brexit discussions that are going on. I happen to vote against Brexit, and I'm involved with uh, uh, people like Tony Blair uh, trying to uh, uh, achieve a second referendum. So and I'll ask you, how does this relate to other people in the state? Because I'm, what I'm going to end up saying is that this whole thing is run with, on the basis of prejudice. And where does any data at all affect people's prejudices? The, 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 the anti-Brexit campaign is just rerunning the whole thing again with um, the, the analyses of the CBI um, uh, 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 and of the Bank of England. And these are all beautifully uh, 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 tailored analyses that make sense to the sort of intelligent people that are in this room, but who make absolutely no difference at all to the people who are going to vote in that. Okay, well, let's put that question because, in. Because they're prejudiced. Yeah, yeah, okay, Indra, let's take that. I mean, big data can make better informed citizens, but it can't because they're prejudiced. I mean, it breaks my heart to hear you talk like that because I know how true it feels, but at the same time, I don't think it's the truth. Right, so the, how it how true it feels is that I think if you occupy, I've just myself stepped out of the what I call the political bubble. So the political bubble I describe as the two percent of people who are members of political parties and the media that feeds on that. Right, so there's a whole. Uh, there's a, that's how the political discourse is created out of these people and this two percent. Right, and within that, uh, I would say that many people are under the influence of that because they believe that to be so. So they're reading their newspapers, they're reading about how the other people are, they're reading about the opposition, depending on what newspaper they're in, they're reading about the state of our lives, the future for our children, and they believe it all. I mean, it, it breaks my heart, I have to say, because it's not the truth, right? If you knock on people's doors and that is the only way you get, this once in five years you get to have a vote. I mean, just think about it, it's just a crime. Right? And you have to fit into that political bubble and then you have to go according to those manifestos that have been crafted by people who come from the elites and only did PP at Oxford. I mean, it's just the whole thing is a, a prison and a trap. Right? To get out of that, you need to spend time in, in communities of people. This, these sorts of things are a really good start because we begin to hear from each other, begin to know what others are like. If you're not, that's the task. That's why I, I'm, I'm going to keep repeating it. It's for us to wake up to the reality that human beings are quite reasonable, want similar things to each other. They are very diverse in their perspectives, and that's a good thing. Okay, right? next question. Um, you had your hand up for a while. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very interested in a slightly different question, not about Brexit, which is in the future, we were able to have what I would describe as AI class, that is artificial intelligence with consciousness. And such robots or entities would A, want to have the right to vote, or turning it around, stand for elected office. Do you think that is possible? And if so, do you, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? OK, Dave, that's over to you. We're going to have robotics having the, the, being a franchise. So, so that's the kind of third time scale I talked about. So there's the short term issues, which are very important. Uh, they're, they're here and now, we, uh, and uh, we need to act immediately. Then there's the medium term issues of potential loss of jobs uh, and wide scale. And then there's the kind of middle of the century, perhaps, 
perhaps sooner in some scenarios, perhaps later in others, in which uh, AIs exceed us in any way and potentially can then uh, explain to us about consciousness. And the hard problem of consciousness may be solved by an AGI. And it may be able to tell us whether or not it is conscious as a result. Uh, I don't think these uh, vastly super intelligent AIs will interact with us. They won't be uh, sitting alongside us, wanting to vote alongside us. The difference between them and us will be what, like the difference between us and uh, mice, you know? Uh, mice, uh, we would not want to enter into a mice democracy. So, and, 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 and there, are lots, there are other bigger scenarios. So I don't think that's entirely right. I don't think we need to consider robots having rights for the short term. We, should, we humans should retain as much control. We should not be abdicating abdi responsibility to robots or to algorithms. We shouldn't say, oh, the algorithm made me do it, therefore I'm devolved of all a blame or... No, no, we, we have to understand and take it. But I'm happy to discuss in another time the, the possibilities for AIs becoming conscious. And I would point to the book by Max Tegmark, Life 3.0, in which he has eight different scenarios about what might happen when AGIs exceed human abilities. And some of these, they become conscious, and some of them they don't. And some of the, these, we are like mice, or worse, compared to the AGIs. In others, they've got the best one, is if they act or they, 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 they protect us. They are the machines that look after us with loving grace, as it were. Okay. Uh, is that a lady who hasn't spoken? What's the question? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, do you think that as we improve artificial intelligence, human intelligence deteriorates? And is it a way that where we can work on human intelligence more or even the same as artificial intelligence? That, that's an interesting. Which one do you want to say that? I mean, increasing in artificial <coughs> intelligence could have a negative effect on human intelligence. Um, yeah, I, I do think that there is something interesting about how a lot of AI technologies are certainly um, sold to us off the back of the limits of us as human subjects, right? So whether that's our memory and also actually there is AI being developed that's going to vote for us, you know, that's a dream of, of one of Silicon Valley uh, gurus that we no longer, just by knowing our preferences and interests and so forth, can now then uh, take over voting uh, for us. And so I do think that there uh, is a sense in which it certainly is uh, conceived as a battle that we can overcome our limitations by AI. So I think that the, that's certainly how it's being sold. But I think we need to um, think about the fact that it's not just that we are more become more limited in our human intelligence. It's that these technologies represent the world in a particular way, or or you know understand the world in a particular way. And so it's a different kind of of uh, society, a different understanding of human life that's being uh, pushed through with this. So it's not a limitation of human intelligence. It's a I guess, I guess a configuration of what social reality is. Okay, uh, Alina and Mary, let's take the two of you together. Um, there's an area that I don't think has been talked about at all. Um, I'm sure you'll tell me if it's all irrelevant. Um, but uh, how can we uh, influence what's going on closer to us? Are we members of organisations? Are we using technologies to uh, uh, enable people to partake in decision making? Um, and the, the technology is there that's not being used. Um, you know, the, the software and websites is there, and it's very, in my experience of the things I'm involved in, it's not being used. People refuse, they're frightened, they don't want, they want to sort of have everything to me and then out again, they don't want to have people talking to each other. And, and a very banal example, um, I, I go to exercise classes uh, because I'm elderly and the office, the centre manager came in one day and he said, you can't go to these classes anymore because they're going to be funded unless you fill in this form. And this form was asking us all of the normal data, uh, name and address and all that, how old we were, when we were born, how long we've been involved, and also things like, uh, what is your sex? Is it the same sex as you were when you were born? Um, and what is your, uh, the ethnic minority? And all those things which make, make you sort of feel really queasy. How do you describe yourself? You know, how British are you? Or whatever, whatever. Okay. And then they're going off to this uh, organisation called... Aging Better in Camden, 
and, and we don't see what they're doing with it. What are they doing with this data? They know how many uh, trans people have taken part in an exercise class in such and such a thing. What, you know, what, for example, what okay. are they doing with this data? Okay, two, Where, how are we controlling yeah, it? Two, point, two points here, but let's take your point first. But can you make it short, because I want to get other people in. I'm I think I agree with most of what they say, but there has never been a time where there's so many jobs alone. This national full employment that we all need to pick up. Because if we don't pick it up, can you imagine London with all these millions of people out on the street, no food, nothing to eat? <coughs> national, we need to have a national debate, really debate about what as human beings, what do we do? Okay. Um, no, I mean, the, the, the first point, there's two interesting points. One is, um, do we really know whether technology has been used good enough in small-scale micro-projects? And secondly, how do we know how the data's been used transparency? Maybe you could deal with the transparency and you could deal with uh, the, the first question. Well, I mean, I think this is a really, I think it's a really important point and I think it's uh, something that uh, we're also very interested in our research because you point to two things. First of all, that there is a, a kind of logic that you need to collect all data that is being pushed through, um, that this is the way that you need to um, understand at also borrower level. And it puts a huge burden on a lot of people who have to constantly provide data, right? So we have to recognize also that we're being burdened with this rise of big data and, and AI. And that's also important because I think you're right, the terms of the consultations that happen with citizens around the implementation of these systems is really lacking. And I think this is somewhere where at local community level, which is something I'm already very interested in pursuing, is where we should be intervening because there needs to be much more impact assessments. How does this impact on people? How are these this data being used? For what purposes? And is that a useful thing to be doing or is it just because we think we need to be in bed with tech companies, right? So I think those are really important <coughs> interventions to have. Okay, and Indra, are we using technology, AI, big data, and that at the local level, at the community level? Uh, not yet. Yeah, I mean, we're looking, we're actively looking for better social, what we call social tech, stuff that helps us to come together. I mean, I think what the meetup tech is fantastic. You know, there's not, but it's been around for a while now, and so what's the next level? But I, I feel the same way as you do. There's a need for us to be able to own our data. You know, there's some sort we're of... We're not using what's there. Mm -hmm. We're not using what's available hardly at all. Exactly. The technology that's available, yeah. okay. we're not using it. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, because they don't quite trust it yet. You know, so, and also, it's in the hands of people asking you questions, but you could surely be able to ask questions back as well. Okay, let's, let's um, let me see this gentleman here. Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. And we've been here also quite a bit against big data and artificial intelligence, but now, I'm kind of more for it because, like, from my perspective, what's got here, like, right now we're standing in front of a revolution, which kind of that the closest parallel can be can be the good and bad revolution appearing with printing machine, mm -hmm. which basically uh, had the result that lost of a huge job, so the people who were like before that copying books, mm -hmm. and also uh, my question is, but also then this good and bad printing revolution led to the appearing of the protest about like, religious war and so on. So, what we should do in order to adapt? Our societies, not to get into our right, not to get into our future civil like, world or kind of. Okay, so David, how do we adapt? Well, I think the analogy is good. We are living through equivalent to the Gutenberg Revolution, or rather, I would say we're living through probably 20 Gutenberg Revolutions in a parallel, because it's not just one revolution but with the discovery of a printing press, it's uh, genetic editing, it's uh, artificial intelligence and big data, it's understanding the brain as never before, it's the creation of quantum computing. It's uh, self-driving self cars and so on. And uh, how do we deal with it? We need to draw on the best resources of humanity as never before. The best, well, a good way to do better foresight is to do better hindsight, to understand what went wrong in the past and what indeed went right in the past. And it includes mapping out the scenarios beforehand, thinking about them objectively. Initially thinking, wow, but then thinking, oh, hang on, maybe this wouldn't be so good. And vice versa, some things that initially might frighten us, if we think about it more calmly and dispassionately, we might think, you know, actually this is a world in which we want to go to. So we need to have these discussions about future scenarios, and then we have to work very hard to achieve the good scenarios. And that involves setting out a vision. 
It also involves political action because there are many vested interests who, for various reasons, don't want these better futures. And we have to fight hard to transform these opponents, where possible, into collaborators too by showing the bigger vision. Okay, Tabby? Um, yes, I'd actually like to follow up directly to that comment with a question. It's kind of perhaps a recurring theme here, which is that um, centralization of power um, using uh, AI is okay as long as we can hold it uh, democratically accountable and this, this term, this golden term of we has continuously been invoked if we have to get better at holding on the accountable and so on. So my question to, uh, to, to the panel is um, who is we exactly and how, how, do, how should we be organised when political parties represent less than 2% of the population? Who's going to organise that? Who's going to manage that? Who is going to oversee it? Who is going to always count? Otherwise, who's going to do all the things that democracies do? Okay, let's take each of you. We're going to have short answers. Starting with Lena, who is we? I mean, uh, I think just a general uh, lesson. For me, we in this is going to be uh, communities who are impacted disparately by these developments, which will be the ones who have historically been under misrepresented in society. So every time we're talking about this and we're talking about the ethical challenges, we should always take it from the position of those who are impacted. And that's the we that I want to bring to the forefront when we're talking about these things. So I think in any kind of community activity, those are the communities that will need to be um, highlighted uh, in all of these discussions. And if the ones who are impacted the most are not happy about what's happening, then we should question it. So I would say no one should be left behind. Anybody who wants to take part in these benefits Anybody who's got an uh, opinion to be contributed, they should all be part of this process. Uh, I think it's a very important question, and it's something that I feel has to be forged. I mean, there isn't really a we in the current democracy because uh, party, parties tend to talk to the nation. And when they talk to the nation, they're talking to individuals who are reading newspapers and receiving the messages that way. So we're sort of atomized right now, and we have to forge we's. And the way that, where we see it happening is mostly at community level. There are a lot of community level initiatives that are bringing people together. And the task is to try to get as diverse a stretch across the community as possible for that to be, to actually you know, represent that community. So, you know, I'm going to plug what we're doing. We do these political laboratories and places where we uh, bring people together to meet each other, literally. The hard work of getting to know each other, that's what we call it has to happen, and so that then you can forge citizens' networks. They don't exist right now. Um, there are millions of networks, they're informal. We need some formal citizens' networks, and from that place we can begin to deliberate in you know, a very practical, real way, using the uh, technology that's increasingly available. It's a task, but it's doable. Hi, uh, my name is Jen. No, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, most of the solutions presented for going forward are aiming at um, maximizing citizen participation and engagement. So I would like to play the advocate here and go from the other side. One of the marvels of modern representative democracy is that it works, even if a lot of people don't care. And you have political parties that work as aggregators for political demands. And these demands can go forward without people actually caring that much, not all of people. So I would like to ask a slightly uh, provocative question. Instead of being scared of systems that infer behavior based on part of the systems that being fair behavior based on aggregate data, can we can, can think of the system as a, as a tool in which we can improve uh, the, political, the, the way that political demands go forward, uh, instead of the, in, 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 in order for the systems to be shared without actually talking? Okay, let's take this chip from here. Oh, uh, my question actually is on my seat. What do we think the potential of using data analysis to be informing gradually more predictive models of our reality? Perhaps an example of simulations, be that statistical or of our sort of reality as we know it, our potential in the future to be able to inform these democratic decisions and make things the best for everybody. Okay, and let's get this to you for trying to get into the front here. Is it too late? So we've had the dictatorships in the past. Democracy is unlikely and from a historical basis. So have we let Trump, Erdogan, and the rest of them in? Is it too late? Has big data already done the damage? OK, well, let's take those questions. Is, um, is big data artificial intelligence 
a master or can it be a tool that can be used for enhancing representative democracy, creating more predictive models, or have we created a world where we're developing now a new type of authoritarian democracy, such as in China and Turkey and so on, where big data can be used to be the master and not the tool. Thank you. Uh, I'm a big fan of the kind of representative de democracy you mentioned, in which uh, people who are, are comfortable with the decisions being taken for them by elected leaders and uh, doing data extrapolation. But it must be with the consent of people. People must know what's going on. They mustn't feel that they're being excluded, that data has been sucked from them without their willing, without their uh, agreement and participation. So the potential is there. But there's also the potential for these algorithms going wrong. We've had the algorithms already making mistakes. I mean, occasionally SatNav tells people to go the wrong way. Uh, maybe it tells you to go the right way 20 times in a row, so you trust it, and then you end up in the back of beyond for some reason. So it could be much worse if we have a driverless government uh, leading us. So we need to have humans paying attention. Are we really going the right way here? Oh no, we're not. You know, let's disengage the sat now for a bit and go back to, to, to something else. Is it too late? No, there's plenty of reasons for optimism. There are lots of great democratic initiatives around the world, even in America, even in the UK. So, uh, but if we are sleepwalking much longer, I don't know how much longer we've got. If we sleepwalk too much, maybe then we'll regret it. Okay, Lena. I just want to say to that I think uh, if you can no longer explain decision making in society, we are actually confronted with a novel challenge for democracy, right? So it depends whether you are you think that democracy can function where decision making takes place without explainability, right? So that is something that I'll throw back to you. Is that something that you think is a functioning democracy? Because that is the challenge. Uh, on representative democracy, well, I think I've made myself clear that I'm not a fan of the current sy system. Um, and it may be partly because I don't recognize its outcomes at all. So what have been the outcomes of this representative democracy? Um, we've got a uh, you know, growth economy, uh, but we've also got epidemics of depression and um, consumerism and, and addiction. I mean, our societies are not healthy. Something is amiss and it needs to change, and I feel quite radically. It doesn't mean representation itself is a bad thing, but it needs to be severely overhauled and the top has to become the bottom. We need a bottom-up uh, revision of democracy. Um, okay. Can I just say, is it too late? No, it's the perfect time. Right? We are in the perfect time. What Trump and Brexit showed us is the disconnect between the bottom and the top. People are trying to take back control, and that's not a bad thing. So let's think about what taking back control of your own life, of your own community, of your own vision for the future, What's that look like? It's a good prompt. They give us a great prompt, but we have to step up now to fill that space. Okay, we've got about five minutes to go with this lady here. So with, um, with big data, it can look scientific, it can look impartial, but actually it's depending on who's asking the questions. And I suppose the people in power are going to be the ones asking the question. My worry is that how limited are we by what we can measure, and are we really in a culture where things are only worth it if they're measurable? and things that are measurable or will get brought to the table to be democratised and decided upon. Yeah. David, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, we're looking on data as something that's measurable and it's affecting our culture, it's affecting how we work in schools and so on. But big data is not just about measurement, is it? It's about making decisions. Yes, so I, I think you make a very fair point. There are very important things which we currently can't measure, and the fact that we don't measure them means that we can deprioritize them unfairly. So let's be clear about it. Let's say when we see a decision based on data that we don't like, let's articulate as carefully as we can what, what we think may be missing, even though it cannot be measured. And then let's work hard to figure out is there a real concept there, or is this just wishful thinking? Is this an old wife's tale that we somehow inherited which we should discard or is there something really really important here that we must hold on to with uh, with all our, all our heart and soul okay let's have one final generic question <laughs> very very short to we'll last week for it's and we're finishing who's got a short question <laughs> okay. for you had your quick question can you some can i summarize this as like an information asymmetry in society you try to bridge that Okay, do you want to take each? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't catch it. So, this is a information asymmetry, and we're trying to equalize information asymmetry. I can take it. You take it. Okay. Um, so, I do think um, 
the nature of big data in the R&R society now is a premise on a fundamental asymmetry, not just of information, but of legibility. We are legible to a number of organizations and governments, and they are not legible to us. So it's absolutely premised on a power asymmetry that should be equalized. So in that sense, uh, yes. I, I just want to say about the, um, is it too, all these questions are is it too late and, and these things are we, you know, how far are we in this? Of course it's not, of course there's lots of things we can do, but there also have to be concrete ways in which we need to think about where we can actually challenge, right? And the reason that I think, uh, raise things like regulation, I raise things like breaking up monopolies is because this is where the nature of how AI and big data is being developed can actually be uh, challenged, I think, the most, right? It's because the, this, um, the consistency upon the, the economic context that we're talking about here is where I think we need to actually point our efforts a lot of, in, in a lot of these discussions. Okay, David, do you want to make a final point and maybe respond to this idea of symmetry? So this discussion is going to continue, for sure. Um, one way it's going to continue is at an event on the 6th of August, Monday the 6th of August, which is probably three weeks tonight, so you read about it on the London Futures website. But there's a more formal debate that uh, Tony uh, uh, is co-hosting with me where we'll formally debate whether we think a digital, uh, a digital dictatorship might be a better way in due course of running society than uh, democracy. The exact motion to be determined. Uh, in terms of the asymmetry, yes, there is a asymmetry of information that it has all kinds of bad consequences. Can we get rid of it totally? No, but we should maximize, we should work hard to explain things and bring more people into the discussion because we'll often get surprising insights when people are brought into the discussion and they'll make us wiser and smarter as a result. So let's not use the asymmetry as an excuse to try and limit the conversation. Instead, let's build on it. And in your brief summary? Brief. I mean, I take it as a philosophical question. You know, yes, asymmetry. Uh, is there always more that we don't know than what we do know? Yes, there always is. There are so many asymmetries that we're trying to uh, address all the time. And one of the things, I'm just going to put, put this in because it hasn't been mentioned at all, uh, one of the great asymmetries is what is in the public space uh, that is due, due to the power imbalance of the 20th century, you know, how much of the public space, everything we're talking about really has been defined until now by men, right? And so what we're arguing about is still a culture and a structure that was defined in the 20th century. Right. The reason I talk about people coming back to their communities because in the communities there's a little bit more balance between awareness of what the women put in and what the men put in, which isn't at the national level and not in the public space. So if we're looking at asymmetries, you can find your new balance, you can find your new uh, manageable space, first of all personally and secondly at a community level, and then you can be doing it peacefully. Okay, thanks. I'm glad you ended up on that point because tomorrow night we're doing a webinar on women and public space which fits in nicely with what you said I must um, know. Yeah. absolutely anyhow I mean thank you everyone I mean thank you London Futures for being involved with us Conway Hall we're Global Net 21 you can look us all up on the meetup site we're all on the meetup site we at Global Net run something like 75 events a year many are webinars many are meetings like here many are in the House of Commons and you're welcome to join in with those as you are, obviously, with the London Future and Samuel Conway Hall. Thank you for all your questions. I mean, it's been really great. And I'm so pleased no one painted. Um, <laughs> this is a hard one there. So, you know, I hope you join us again. In September, we're going to have a little planning meeting of the meetings we're going to do in the future at Conway Hall. And I'll talk to Dave about that in case any of you want to be involved in that as well as our people so we can discuss it. But thank you for attending, and I hope it's uh, been an enjoyable evening.